You know? Right. Okay. Well, we've got 45, we've, we're at the 45 minute mark. And what I've been doing, you know, I used to like start a second stream. Okay. And, th- but I, instead I'm just cutting these things in half. So why don't we just stay on here? Okay. And in the next half in the parrot room, we'll talk about uh, how enjoyment is playing out in this conflict with the, with Ukraine. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see We still, to a large extent, live in the interregnum between, between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. So uh, Todd McGowan is back. He teaches film and critical theory in the English department at the University of Vermont. He has written several books, including one that is coming soon from Sublation Press, entitled Enjoyment Right and Left. Uh, Todd is our premier author he's going to be the face of sublation since he is all about sublation yeah (laughs) well you know i i i think you're up to it todd i i i i I have utter confidence in you um and uh today we're going to be talking about enjoyment um and uh just what it means as a psychological category um and and so todd i'm going to ask you like a real basic question here at the start uh enjoyment how is that category different from pleasure? Right. So that's a big, that's the key thing, right? So, so Freud defines pleasure in a way that seems counterintuitive, but I think it's pretty helpful. He defines pleasure as the lessening of excitation. So it's like, you know, I think his model is the sexual experience where the, you feel pleasure at the end when the, your, your excitation is lessened. And that's the, that's the experience of pleasure, both for male and female. Uh, and then enjoyment. So, so pleasure is the, is the release of excitation. And then enjoyment, I would define almost as the reverse of that, as the buildup of excitation or as the way that you raise obstacles for yourself, cause problems for yourself, and that those actually give you a way to desire. So, so that, so that the actual erection of something that goes against what you, <laughs> yeah. sorry, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I, I turned into Beavis and Butthead, Todd. I know, what is I wrong with you? You said erection and I laugh. Uh, I've been watching uh, Come Town. Okay, go yeah. ahead. Um, so right. So but it's the it's the raising up of a of a of a barrier. <laughs> oh, I can't get out of it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and that and, and so and that gives us something that is the way that enjoyment is created. So I think it's an interesting one of the metaphors I use in the book is the is the metaphor of a roller coaster, you know, so enjoyment would be the, the path up the hill and then pleasure would be that release that comes when you go down the hill. So I think that's a, you know, I think we tend to think that pleasure is what dominates our lives and what we're, what's driving us. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the ideas of psychoanalysis that Freud gets too late and never really develops. And then Lacan kind of develops, but doesn't really. And, and then people today are more developed is that really it's enjoyment that's the driving factor. So these problems that we cause for ourselves are actually what drive us to act in the way that we do, not the not just immediate pleasures, right? Not the release of tension, but actually the building up of tension. Yeah. Um, another uh, analogy that comes to mind is Christmas morning um, and yeah. the uh, enjoyment that I remember getting from Christmas when I was a kid, it was all about the fantasy of what I would receive as a present. Um, And it it might've been things that I would actually, I did end up receiving sometimes the things I didn't end up receiving, but it was the uh, anticipation more than it was the actual getting that I enjoyed. And right. So the difference is a great example, Doug. So, so the difference would be enjoyment is the wrapping paper. And then mm-hmm. pleasure is the taping taking off of the wrapping paper, right? Like, right. so, so you know, if the if the if the if the presents were just under the tree unadorned, 
there'd be no thrill at all to it. I could just be like, okay, like I'm clearly, I'm getting that thing. That's fine. But it's the, it's the precise addition of the paper around it that makes it something enjoyable. And then when you have the pleasure of ripping it off and that's why, I mean, I'm sure everyone has felt this way. I used to have this terrible depression Christmas afternoon because I would be like, Oh, I already got everything. It's, and it's fine. It's what I asked for maybe, but it seems like it's inadequate to what I expected. And so that's the, that's, I think, the relationship between pleasure and enjoyment. Like enjoyment is this buildup and then pleasure is the release and the release is always less than the buildup. Yeah. I'm going to stay with the Christmas metamor- metaphor for a moment longer, but um, uh, just because I, I find it interesting uh, in, in and of itself, one of the things that I I think would solve the Christmas depression Christmas Day yeah. depression was when you received gifts that you didn't know you wanted. You got something that was a, you know, maybe I remember one year I received a, a big compendium of all of the Superman comics yeah. from the very first one until like the fifties or something. It's pretty great. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't ask for that. There, that wasn't in my mind, yeah. but I then had the uh, added enjoyment of reading that book all day all afternoon uh and and enjoying not knowing what's gonna happen next not knowing about the story and then finding it out um so that's one of the things about i guess uh life that is worth remembering is that you know getting exactly what you want often doesn't bring you anywhere well isn't that because i think there's a good psychoanalytic explanation for that that's because what you want isn't what you desire right so that there's this disjunction between your conscious wish and your unconscious desire and whoever got you that present read your this is a term from joan Kopchick. she has a book called read my desire and they read your desire they didn't just listen to your wish and what's interesting is the algorithm i think that's this is the most nefarious thing about the algorithm right like it it reads our unconscious wishes, but it never reads our desire. And so I've never been surprised by what Amazon has suggested suggested for me, right? Like it's never been right. one of these like happy surprises. Oh my God, that's just the book that I wanted, but I never thought of it. No, it never happens. And so I think that that's the, that, I mean, it's, it's a, not, that's a really nice example about that distinction, which I think is really important. Right. Um, Another example uh, of just sort of reading your unconscious desire, and maybe it's done uh, through a coincidence. I I have this example that's a coincidence where um, uh, I wanted to read the novel, The Parallax View. I had the the desire or the you know the wish to read that novel. I'd seen the movie, I'd uh, read like a chapter of the novel. Um, or maybe I'd read the whole novel and then returned it and wanted to read it again. I think that's what it was. So I checked it out of the library or put it on hold. Okay. And I got to the library to pick it up. And it wasn't the novel. It was Slavoj Zizek's book, <laughs> The Parallax. <film. laughs> Which is how I was introduced to Slavoj Zizek. Wow. By, Doug, that's um, a great story. You know what's funny about that story is that when that book came out, I wrote him. I said, you know, I love the movie. I can't read to re- re- I can't wait to read your novelization of it. So it's funny. <laughs> it's funny that you had that, that little, uh, that little, little yeah. slip. You know, the, 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 the movie was based on the novel, I think. Yeah. The novel. Yeah. Okay, fair. But anyway, no, I, yes. I, I know. I think that's right. Yeah. yeah I was just, you was you were just giving him crap, uh, crap. Yeah. I know. Um, yeah. So anyway, yeah. So the, and, uh, when something like that happens, you get the sense you might start having a religious sensibility because like somehow the universe is reading your unconscious desire for right. you and delivering right. things to you. Right. Um, all right. So, but to, to go back to this enjoyment uh, as you're writing about it, um, which is the, the other thing about it is that it, that you mentioned and that, that I think is pretty commonly understood uh, in, in Lacanian circles is that enjoyment is excessive it goes beyond um true enjoyment goes beyond the 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 moment of release or for uh uh and and pleasure and the the diminishment of excitation um so how does how does that work why is enjoyment um not just a process of building up for uh pleasure and then a release what how does so 
Right. That right. It's a good question. Cousin. So it, it builds, it's a buildup, but it's always an excessive buildup. Right. And that's what makes it, that's the source of the enjoyment is the excess. And so it's a, I think one way that I think about it is in relationship to what's good for us. Right. So if something is that, that enjoyment has to involve some kind of sacrifice of what's good for us. Right. If, if it does, and if it, if it doesn't involve that, then it's not, there's no enjoyment in it. So that's why I think, uh, I don't use this example in that book, but in another one that I'm working on right now, I use the example of skydiving, right? Like no one skydives for exercise, right? Like it's not, there's nothing beneficial for us, for our good. I mean, it's a nice view, I guess, but it's, it's also the fact that I, I have a friend who's a close friend who's a skydiver. And she says, it's the fact that you could die. You know, you pack this shoe suit, you make sure that you're not going to die, but you're still adding to the risk that you could die. So it's this excessive act that goes beyond the everyday. It's not done for your own good. This is why one of the exa other examples I like to think of is foods, right? Like the foods that are most enjoyable are the foods that are not good for us, right? Whereas the, if we know a food is good for us, then it's it's less enjoyable than a food that we know isn't good for us. It's why like smoking is enjoyable and drinking herbal tea less so, right? Because <laughs> right. like what you're enjoying is the very excess of, I mean, part of the excess is the transgression of what is accepted, right? I'm going to drink some coffee, which is excessive. There you go. There's something excessive too. Mm. Um, so, right. Uh, so, so it goes beyond what's, what's good. It's beyond what's useful, right? So it's not just like, Certain foods are useful for keeping us alive. Other ones are in excess of that. And so that, mm. I, I mean, I think all those, that, like to me, that term you chose excess is the crucial idea, right? Like it's the, that, that, and, and one of the political examples I use in the book is obviously, I mean, Donald Trump seems like the perfect example because he allows his adherence to be excessive. You know, like I think of those rallies where he would say like, beat the crap out of those media guy or the proto protester. I'll pay your bail. Right. Like mm. he let, he lets them do things that aren't even allowed by the law, but he's sanctioning them mm. and pressuring people to do them. So I think that that kind of, I mean, that, that would be the most extreme version of excess. I mean, we're, we're seeing it right now. We're recording this while there's a country being bombarded with a, a complete excess, you know, like the, like, like it would be useful to attack military targets alone right but there's something excessive about attacking like maternity hospital or things like that and i think that that's part of the you know there's a kind of enjoyment calculus on the part of the uh, attacker so i think that that's that really is uh you know it's I, I don't think it's operative just on a local level i think it's operative even in you know international relations for sure you're right yeah i think you're, you're right um in the parent room you know, in our second half of this conversation, I want to talk about the situation in Ukraine ex more extensively. Like, I think there's some a lot to unpack there. Um, but I, I'm still curious as to, like, what is the structure? Why, basically, what is it about human consciousness that demands the success? Why are we driven to excess? What it, why is that what it takes for us to receive enjoyment and I guess the category that comes to mind that I don't fully understand is a Freudian death drive. You mentioned your yeah. friend found skydiving to be enjoyable precisely because it put her life at risk. Yeah. Um, is enjoyment connected to this death drive? Absolutely. Absolutely. So the point though, is that death isn't necessarily literal death. I mean, it can be right. Like it can like clearly like uh, eating, you know, I love like little cookies. Clearly, eating too many cookies is not a uh, it doesn't help you live a long life, but uh, or big piece of chocolate cake, but uh, or going, you know, having unprotected sex wildly, right? All these things don't help you lead a long life, but they're not, it's not necessarily a literal death. Like, what it does is it, 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 it like for Freud, I think, and I don't think he works this out fully, but and I do think you're right to say death drive is absolutely connected to enjoyment and to the excessiveness of enjoyment. It's what drives us to act excessively. And I think it's because it introduces something that's not there in our into our world that is something that's absent, something that's lost, something that's lacking that then we can enjoy it. So it's beyond just the world of actual, the actual objects we have around us. So there's, it, it, I almost would say, 
No, I would say this, that, that, it, 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 that, that, that the excess is an excess of transcendence, that it's only by putting our life at risk, whatever, like we create these transcendent values. It's like the way people, you know, are willing to join, say, the, the army to fight for their nation, right? Because the nation for them is a transcendent value above their life. Like they put their life at risk for the nation. Why would they do that? It's because they're they're trying to forge these things that count. I mean, things that make it worth living, right? Like if you stripped away, I said this a week ago on a podcast, like if you stripped away all sources of excess and enjoyment, you, you would just kill yourself. Like that, that really is the thing that keeps, that fuels your existence, you know? So it can be even be stupid little things, but, but it, nonetheless, or it can be a big thing like the country or like, uh, I don't know, the idea of communism, whatever, like something that's really transcendent that then drives you forward. I mean, I, and what I want to do is connect that to like to the psyche itself, right? Like these things that seem like, oh, we're driven by these big ideas. Yeah, I think that, but I also think why? Because that's how our enjoyment is structured. Like creating this absence in the empirical world gives us this access to a transcendent idea or transcendent yeah. motivation. You know, um, I remember watching the Pervert's Guide to Cinema. I think it was, yeah. and and Zizek talks about how uh, there's a, a moment where <clears throat> your fantasy uh slips away from you and the un and like and the virtual reality the um the transcendent reality slips away from you mm -hmm. and with it reality itself just everyday empirical reality right uh, disappears as well that 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 is like the dark night of the soul was when you don't have right. the transcendent reality it's not as though you have an option to just be practical Right. And right. Uh, according to yeah. Zizek, yeah. Um, it's a great point, Doug. It's a great point. You know, he he gives this example of um, this is like one. I think it's an early book. Maybe it's looking or I this uh, example of the, this. Not, it's a science fiction novel, The Unpleasant Profession of Jonathan Hogue. And this guy, they're like remaking the entire universe outside his car. And they say, just don't roll down the window while this process is going on. And he rolls down the window and there's just like this formless muck outside and he can't, mm -hmm. and there's like no reality at all. So I think that's exactly right. Like if you don't have this point of that transcends it all, then you lose access to the practical. So, so there's no such thing, I guess I would say as real politic, right? Like there's no such thing as just being practical, empirical, et cetera. Right. No, that's a, that's a really good uh, point that um, yeah, there, there's, uh, I don't know if it's an American or or British or, but there's this idea that we should become pragmatists in right. in our relations, and we should give up on ideologies and give up on higher meanings and and just do what is um, best. And but if you look at what is best, it always has an ideological component. Right. Always. Who's the model for that? Kissinger. I mean, it's <laughs> right. like, it's kind of crazy, <laughs> right? right? right. It's like, right. right. Yeah. That's a real politique model. And then, then yeah. the, but like this sort of just straightforward pragmatism is always like a hedonistic calculus. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, but then you look at that, if you scratch that too much and it's, oh, there are some pleasures that are better than others. And right. Why right. is that? And yeah, why is that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why meanings is that? Right. and all, all sorts right. of things emerge. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, not to put a, a plug for my own book in here. Well, actually, exactly to put a plug yeah, for that. my own book in here. Yeah. Um, I wrote a book, a novella a few years ago, many years ago, really, a decade ago, uh, called Wave of Mutilation, which was all about a character who fan the fantasy of life was slipping away oh, and cool. things were becoming more and more shallow and, and cartoonish as a so, so in long. the film version, they can have the Pixies song right at the beginning of that, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. I, yeah. I didn't pick the title my editor did, and it was a great title to pick. Yeah. I actually wish I was still working with that editor because he would just make demands upon me, like, write a book with this title. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's cool. Uh, anyway, but it was very much influenced by this Zizekian concept. Yeah. And uh, but then what I guess so we we've we've got a, at this point in our conversation, we've got a little bit of a grip on uh, enjoyment and the excess. It still is not clear to me exactly why we require fantasies. And, but I think it has something to do with being self-conscious, being human rather than simply being instinctive. That's right. That's right. Animals. I mean, that, that, that's basically, I mean, I think that's the, 
one of the great contributions of Freud, right? That that it's not just that to be a subject is to be not just driven by instinct, but driven by drives. And that the, 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 so what happens is the instinct collides with culture or the society or whatever, and then becomes a drive, right? So, so what, what are, like, there's no such thing for Freud in, anymore as just once you're a speaking being for, you know, there's no such thing as just a, an animal instinct, like an instinct of hunger, an instinct for sex, right? Like it, it becomes, it becomes distorted when it enters into like the, the psyche of the speaking being. So, yeah, I think if you want to call that self-consciousness or whatever you want to call it, right? Like that's, that's what, that's what, that's what creates that shift so that it becomes impossible to explain the actions or, or decisions of that figure on the basis of just some kind of instinct, because that instinct has gotten deformed so that actually rather than propelling its life, it kind of turns against its life, right? Like that. So right. we're the being. So the fact that we can, and now we're even closing on it again, like the fact that we can destroy the world, I don't think is an accident. It's not an accident that other animals didn't, haven't developed that capacity to destroy all living beings on the planet. Like, I think that that's like, that's part of what, that's part of this, what Freud would call death drive and, and what, you know, what I want to insist is enjoyment. Um, yeah. Uh, I hope that we can figure out another way to uh, be excessive. And, yeah, 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 of course. Of course. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. But that, that helps. So it, um, it has to do with being in relation to the world rather than simply being of it. That's right. That's uh, right. So I'm, I'm very much against, you know, so Martin Heidegger, and I think it's not an accident that he was a right winger. Like, I think he has this notion of being in the world that, that, what we've forgotten is the fact that we're first of all just in the world. And I think that's completely wrong. I think that what we first of our, first of all is alienated from the world. And so it's the attempt to refuse that alienation that then creates things like capitalism, like right wing fanaticism, all these things, right? Like, so I think that's a really, you're important that important phrase that you use there being in the world. I think that's a really, I think there's something seductive about that. I think a lot of people want to say, Oh, let's, let's return to just some idea that we're just another being in the world, part of an actor in a network, you know? And I think that that's a really, that's a mistake because I think it, it tries to write out this excessiveness out of uh, right. Out of humanity. Yeah. And the excessiveness, which we have to take, which makes us like, people with responsibilities and yeah. ethical right judgments and um and individuals that's right uh, that's right like, like like i mean for kant it's precisely i mean his whole idea it's so revolutionary you know i think i've just been thinking about this like it's so revolutionary because he's the first to say morality has nothing to do with what's good for us or what's good for other people it's just we get a moral duty based upon what's excessive in us, which he thought was reason, but it could be whatever, right? And so that excessiveness within us is actually what makes us moral too. So it makes us, on the one hand, on the verge of destroying the world, on the other hand, it makes, it's the source of all morality. So I think that, and I think it's interesting, you know, Kant's relationship to the onset of capital, right? Like, like mm -hmm. capital, is, he's already after, but he's not fully after enough to be Marx, right? So- mm -hmm. So there's a sense in which he kind of gets this fundamental disruption, but he's like, wait a minute, it seems to be going the wrong way and we need to take it in this moral way instead. And then of course that doesn't happen, but, but nonetheless, that's the source of our moral being. So I think it's really important. So he, do you think Kant saw um, the, the society moving towards uh, a kind of pragmatism yeah. um, uh, treating uh, every, every, Buddy instrumentally, yeah. um, and yeah, yeah to... I think that's exactly what he was writing against. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Like, like the in the second version, the critique of the uh, of the moral law, he makes the point, and I, I think this is a great point that you cannot you cannot use the other simply as a means only. And it what what is that but a critique of capital, right? Like, it seems like I don't know how to understand that in any other way. I never have. I just think. Like he's making an exact critique of the incipients of capital and capitalism. Right. Goals. I mean, it could be a critique of slavery um, right. as well. Right. right. But right. but not as clearly, I don't think, because right. in the slave society, 
there was a notion that there were different types of subjects that had different right. responsibilities. Absolutely. Whereas in capitalism, it was there, there's the subject and then there are all these objects, these, these things that are merely means they don't, they don't have any, you know, category of subjectivity right. to them really. Um, right. I, I mean, it's a great point that, that it, it's, it seems to be clearly not a critique of Aristotle because you know, for Aristotle, people just had different levels within the society, and Kant just absolutely rejects that idea, right? Like for him, right. he just thinks everyone is. I mean, there's some racist things that he says, which I think are important to talk about, but I think that they are betrayals of his own idea, right? So I think that, mm-hmm. but I think basically, the idea is that uh, that everyone is equal as a moral being, like no matter where they are in the society, and that kind of that kind of equality is just obviously un knowable in a slave holding society right Right. yeah um so the other question i had written down before we started uh was to ask if the enjoyment is if it's connected to death drive which we've said that it is is it also connected to the super ego which is the topic that we talked about last time you're on yeah 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 it's it's a good it's a great question and I, i think it absolutely is and i think so my idea is just that that Enjoyment is the is the or superego is maybe that I would call it the right wing form that death drive takes right like it gets deviated into this conformist uh, pressure which doesn't seem like conformity and I think that's the really important issue like I don't think anyone who's to bring back to this Trump example at the rally mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't think anyone who's beating up a protester at the Trump rally thinks that they are obeying someone right they think they're letting themselves go. I'm unleashing my myself, but in fact, I think you have to you have to judge that as a as a capitulation to an authority figure, and that's why I think Trump is a very super egoic figure because he's telling people obey in this way and you'll enjoy yourself. And so, to me, super ego is precisely this turning of death drive into uh, something that's socially uh, accepted, right? Even if it's even if it's you know, something that doesn't seem like it fits, but it actually like if, to choose a more ancient example, like the not ancient enough, but the the example of the lynch mob, right? Like the lynch mob seems to me driven by the superego and the way in which death drive gets turned into and like this is kind of fervor to the lynch mob. Right. And they and 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 a refusal to be acquiesced, a total excessiveness. Right. Nothing is ever enough mm-hmm. for the lynch mob. And so that that seems to me to be another example of the way in which this death drive gets turned into superego and then gets, and then gets unleashed in favor of social, like, like skydiving doesn't help the social, doesn't help any social authority, right? Like it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't like mm, maybe it no, does. Not directly, not directly, not directly. I mean, maybe it keeps like, I guess you could do this whole bread and circuses thing where it keeps people right. Uh, I would say like, just it, it's a way for it's another part of the service economy, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah that's you know, true. Some, that's true. But yeah, but most, but then you'd have to rule out like a lot of things that, you know, like playing tennis and bolt, whatever. I mean, it's yeah, sort right. of an anodyne thing, but, but I think that like, but yeah, you're right. But, but it's not. It doesn't seem to me like it's clearly serving the social authority in the way that it's not it's, serving a political authority. Right. It's right. it's it's part of an economy. It's part of the economic structure for sure. Right. For yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and th- and it's really clear that the kind of uh, enjoyment you get out of beating up a Bernie Sanders supporter, um, or by sending someone to a Trump rally with the intention of provoking a beating, right. which is what happened in that. Instance. Right, it's right. important to know yeah. that both those things are happening um that that is uh in the service of of the political authority as it is yeah re- reaffirming it right. i can't i just can't imagine that you're being uh, uh uh beating up a commie at a trump rally and not thinking i'm doing this for america i'm doing this to hold on this is a threat to, to right i guess myself. that's true i guess you are thinking that but you're not i don't think you think you're obeying i guess that's the thing i would say Right. right. I am freely and maybe excessively going beyond what is right. allowed. Right. To, like imagine defend. the contrast between you're like dirty you know, Harry. Trump. What? You're dirty Harry. That's right. You're dirty Harry. Right. Exactly. That's like, like the dirty Harry enjoyment. Right. Like, like, okay. like it's the contrast between like a cops behind you and you got to try drive under 25 miles an hour in the school zone versus, you know, Trump saying beat the crap out of that guy. There's a wild difference between those two things. I think, right? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Um, 
So the, we begin to get to the main point of your book here, which is the kind of distinction we want to draw between right-wing enjoyment that is enjoyment that is in the service. We could call it conservative enjoyment, right? Yeah, yeah. Something that tries to conserve the political authority that exists today. Um, enjoyment that is, if the thing that may be the most interesting about it is that it's not fundamentally excessive. It doesn't go beyond the political, it tries, it doesn't aim to go beyond, it may accidentally, but it doesn't aim to go beyond right. the political Right. structure and power well, of, of today when you say it this way that it uses excess to to support what is in place right right like it, yeah 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 exactly whereas left-wing uh enjoyment is also perhaps excessive and maybe even at times violent but it doesn't it doesn't act in the service of an existing order or existing political authority it acts in the interest of its own transcendent Meaning? Yeah, yeah. It's, its own universality, I think, right? Like it, the solidarity of everyone, the quality of everyone. Yeah, like I think those th those are the, like that's the ideal that, that a leftist enjoyment is, is aiming towards. But I also think that it gets, like rather than, I mean, the big thing for me in the book, as you know, is that the leftist enjoyment can't have an enemy. Like once you get an enemy, then you've, you've fallen into this trap of of right wing enjoyment, so that right wing enjoyment all it needs the enemy, it needs the person at the rally that we hate, it needs, or it needs China, it needs some it's some external figure that it can that it can it can use to create the ex, focus the excessiveness on. Whereas mm -hmm. I think left wing enjoyment can have, I just use this difference, but maybe someone would say it's semantic, but that can have adversaries. But you're always saying to the adversary, come on over to our side because. This is the side of universality. So you're never saying to the person like, we want to wipe you out. Instead, we want to get you to come over to our side. So I think that's a, to me, mm -hmm. that's an important distinction between the two. And and the right wing form just can never say that because if it doesn't have the enemy, it falls apart. Like I, I give this example in the book of, of Charlottesville. They can't say, very well say to Jews around them, like, come join our rally saying Jews will not replace us. You can't. Do it, right. Yeah. Right. No. Right. right no. no. But in, in, in contrast, like the Black Lives Matter movement, they could say to the cops, I understand this didn't happen that often, but it did happen. Like, join this, jo kneel down with us. You're part of us. So I think that's mm -hmm. a really, that distinction seems to be really, really important. Right. And you could even have, I mean, not to uh, give Trump too much credit, but you could even have a rally that was about theoretically make America great again. And say to the Jews and to who you know whoever uh, whatever ethnicity was around, come join us because the in the American project the, that's a diverse right. that's right. Um, that's uh, right. project. It's universal for Americans, but what for you couldn't Americans, do is, but it still right? requires you couldn't say to a Canadian, right? yeah, come join us. In fact, I I think we're far too lenient on the Canadians. It's my feeling <laughs> <laughs> personally. Um, so uh, yeah. Yeah, so this is what so what is it about left wing enjoyment then that uh isn't that doesn't need an enemy that can go beyond needing an enemy? What makes is it just a matter of being nicer? It's not, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a friend in graduate school who had a bumper sticker that said mean people suck. And I mm -hmm. think uh, maybe that's a leftist idea. I don't know. But no, I don't think it's a matter of just being nicer or that mean people suck. I think it's a the idea is that that the leftist enjoys precisely the failure of the social order to come together as a whole, whereas the right wing figure wants to enjoys the wholeness. And th in order to create the whole, you need the enemy to kind of quilt the whole together. And so the leftist finds enjoyment in the gap itself, in the failure itself. And mm -hmm. if you don't, if you need the whole and you need the enemy, then you're actually even if you imagine yourself a leftist, I think you're actually a right wing figure. Right. So I think that that's, that's a really important, like, to me, that's the distinction. Like, can you enjoy the very failure of like the fact that the, the collective emerges, I think that my leftist understanding of a collective is that the collective emerges out of the failure of it to become whole right? with a W right. That there's always a hole with a, just an H in the hole with a W so that, that, mm -hmm. so that, Sorry, that, <laughs> no, I love it. <laughs> uh, but that, that that and so that that idea emphasis on the what's missing 
-hmm. is the leftist project. And that's why so many leftist projects take up the case of those who are neglected, missing, not counted, right? And says like, well, we're going to count them. We're going to say that they're part of that. Like those who aren't counted are actually part of what we're doing. Jacques Rancière, the French uh, Marxist philosopher, had, has this thing. He says the part of no part, that that is those that, that communism takes the part of those who have no part within the society. And I kind of, I think that's pretty good formulation, mm -hmm. but something like that idea that the, the leftist politics has to focus on that what's missing and that, mm -hmm. that the enjoyment comes from the, what's missing, not from the image of wholeness that we would try to. Yeah. Feel. I, I think of it. Um, wait, uh, well, I, I, I worry that this formulation might sound like holding on to the same problem, like not getting beyond, uh, let's say a racist society, but right. enjoying the fact that some are excluded and trying to, um, to champion, but on the side of the excluded. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, but, but in fact, I think of this gap as like a realm of freedom. Yeah. It's so it's a like, um, in, uh, like you can always come up with a different way to solve this problem. And what you'll discover is that now there's a gap somewhere else. That's right. But it doesn't, but you, but, and when you are, when you can accept that you're going to not become whole, but just start a process of, transformation mm -hmm. then that's when you are free and that's when you can enjoy this excess in a left-wing way totally as, agree as a totally totally perfectly put perfectly put i think i think you nicely articulated the danger too in the beginning right that the project the leftist project becomes hysterical that it just it starts to get off on the on the on the fighting itself and so you need someone it like wants the person to stay it's like I don't know if you know this novel by Ralph Ellison, Invisible Man, right? Like mm -hmm. the Communist Party in that novel, they want him to remain in this marginalized position because they they want to keep fighting for him in that marginalized position. He's like, wait a minute, I don't want to stay in this position. They're like, we don't care. Right. You're in there. So I think that is a clear danger for right. the left. And I love the way you described it, right? Like, because it's a structural point, right? Like, it's not like there's certain there's someone necessarily occupying it. And I, I ideally we would exist in a society where it's a structure that's a structural point that's empty. So there's this point of where of of or or rather it's the opposite, like that, that we're all feel like we're we don't belong. And then the point of belonging, the feeling the, no one feels like they really belong. And then that would be kind of my version of a collectivist leftist society. For me, then forgive my nerdiness here, but for me in to in today's society, the real material gap is in uh, what Marx called value, but it was it's in production. It's it's the value that arises from our collective work to create things that we exchange. Yeah. And when you examine what it is that's really being exchanged is a complete abstraction. It's, it can only be measured in like hours or minutes. And it, and it, and you, and it's not, you know, different amounts of commodities get produced in different amounts of time. It's just a wild mess and it, it, it yeah. goes flying off the rails immediately. But, but that's where there's emptiness actually. It's because that is not a sensuous real object. It is right. only our own. It's only us acting, right? Together, right. and and a measurement of that, that then we've then created into the transcendent value that that regulates our social relations. Right. And so, yeah. as a Marxist, the aim is to say, now that's not going to be how we organize our productive work. We are going to organize ourselves along different lines, you know. And then then it, that becomes a difficult part, and you and. Marxists have to accept that whatever we come up with will cre probably create some other will be virtual. Right. It will not be, re it will not be substantial and whole and complete. History right. Exactly. Won't end. Exactly. That's the point. That's my point. Yeah. 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 Um, but nonetheless, that's where I feel like the gap is in society. Ultimately, it's not in uh, any particular ethnic group. It's not in any political category. Uh, it, uh, it's in, 
what organizes our productive work. Um, that's why we're in, in under capitalism um, rather than, and uh, you know, feudalism or some other religious right, system. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Um, and I, I guess the question is since, since we've gone through, we, you know, we were, we agree with each other a lot. We like understand each other. We agree yeah, with each yeah. other. So my, yeah. my, what I wonder is why do you think this is so difficult actually for so many different political factions to take up? Why has this been a hindrance in itself? Why are we regressed? Yeah. Um, well, I think that, you know, I mean, there's this whole Frankfurt school explanation, right. Of, of, of like repressive desublimation by Marcuse and, and that, you know, people get invested in the commodity goods and they can't, get out of it. But I, I just think, I actually think that it's the factor of enjoyment, like the, the way in which capitalism, uh, the way that it has to grasp and the way that it's kind of grafted itself onto the structure of our desire is nefariously ingenious. And so it gives, so it, so we enjoy the inevitable failure, like even Bezos, even the richest, like they continually fail to get the enjoyment they think they're going to get, right? Like they have that Christmas day experience even when he flies up into space right but but nonetheless they keep they keep on they're seduced by the idea that oh i just need the right commodity or enough commodities and i think that's the seductive part of it like i think that idea that i can just accumulate my way into like it can be like i can accumulate my way into a good life for my children fine everyone would say that's a good thing or i can accumulate my way into like greatness my own greatness whatever it is right like i think that that image of a future that never comes has been it's, it's, and the fact that it the the way in which it it it, it fits onto the self-destructiveness of death drive is really i think that's to me that's the key to capitalism's staying power and its resistance to fights against it yeah so um it, the the thing about Bezos's drive is that he doesn't have to change the terms of his desire. He can just keep aiming at the same right. uh, com illusory kind of wholeness and completeness. Like yeah. if I can only get to the moon, right. then, then I'll be <laughs> right. a real person kind of right. thing. Right. Um, I mean, like I kind of understand that uh, personally, like as a young person, when I started to try to write fiction, I just felt like, oh, you know, if I can uh, only get a short story published, then I'm yeah. a real yeah. person, right? And then I finally did, and, and then it was a novel, right? Right. Then it was a novel. Yeah. Um, and I still want to write, but there got to be a point where I it dawned on me that no matter what I did, yeah, not if I got uh, if I wrote the next Harry Potter, if I had a movie made about my work, if a dozen starlets lined up for me, you know, yeah. if whatever it would be none of it was going to actually fix this thing that I was trying to fix this way. Right. Um, and that I, uh, I was never really going to be a real boy. So I had to uh, d deal with being a puppet for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know. Sometimes I succeed at that. Sometimes I don't, but, um, but I do think that that's, not to toot my own horn, and I don't think most people would uh, agree, but it's the kind of maturity that we have. We're asking people to have, like to yeah. accept that limitation. Yeah. Um, and I guess one of the problems that might also be in play here is that when people are not like uh, maybe that Maslow's hierarchy of needs question is part of it. Like if you feel like you have to struggle just to survive then you're not likely to redefine what's driving you. It, right. Does that make sense? I guess you? so. But, uh, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm less, I grew up among a lot of people that none of my relatives, they were all like that. None of them had anything really. And they, so I, maybe I should take it easy on them, but, uh, I, I, I guess I just saw, I never have seen this great difference psychically between classes that I've been around. So I just haven't, I don't know. I mean, it, it, maybe I'm wrong about that and maybe my experience is too limited or something, but I just, I, I've seen, you like, don't think that like a uh, relatively affluent upper middle-class people feel more free and are more likely to take risks. No, than... I think it's the opposite. 
Okay. I think it's the opposite. That's why I'm against tenure. Because I think tenure is designed to keep academics quiet and in place because you, you teach them total discipline for six years. Like you discipline them into like, okay, you can't say anything wrong because somebody's going to fire you. You don't mm-hmm. want to say the wrong thing to the other professors because they're going to decide on your tenure case. By the time you get tenure, what do you say? You're just, you've already been disciplined. So you never, I've never seen one person so all of a sudden become freed by tenure to say, to write the most radical book ever. I've just, it's never happened in human history. So I just think like, and I think the same thing with like wealth, like it doesn't free people to, to do whatever. It makes them even more entrenched in there because they want to protect what they have. They don't want to. And I think there you could make the argument that the less you have, the more willing you're just, you are to throw it away. You know, I think that because you have less to protect. So I don't, I just, I think there's a kind of secret idealization of the wealthy that goes on in this kind of, in that kind of, I know a lot of people think that, but I think in that kind of calculus, I really think that that's what is happening. So I don't, I'm, I mean, yeah. I could be wrong. I don't know. No, 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 no. I, that makes sense to me. It has interesting consequences. It means that rather than focusing on making sure, for instance, that the welfare state uh, raises everyone up to an upper middle class lifestyle, that we should instead organize for working class power. Right. Tear a few of these people down. That's what I say. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah, right, right, rather than right. raising them up, let's tear some people down. Like let's tear, like let's put a maximum income, right? Like that would be a good start to me. That's a nice starting point. Yeah. Like, just as a maximum income. And then like, let's see what happens on the basis of that. Right. You know? Right. Okay. Well, we've got 45, we've, we're at the 45 minute mark. And what I've been doing, you know, I used to like start a second stream Okay. And but I instead I'm just cutting these things in half. So why don't we just stay on here? Okay. And in the next half in the parrot room, we'll talk about uh, how enjoyment is playing out in this conflict with the with Ukraine. Right. Yeah. Um, and I'll just get the ball rolling by saying that uh, I am not enjoying uh, the 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 impasse that I feel that I'm in with. Uh, uh, Ukraine, or when, or when I have had moments of enjoyment, I find them incredibly suspect. And I'll give you an a, example of my enjoyment. If you enjoy these videos, you should click on the subscribe button and click that bell. You should also consider supporting me on Patreon. Patrons get access to a second behind-the-scenes parrot room discussion where we dish out gossip or go into the weeds on topics such as the tendency of the rate of profit to decline, imperialism, and the critical theories of Tiffany Brissett and Donald Most. You'll also get access to both the public and private version of the revised Pop the Left series with Ashley Frawley and Pascal Robert, and the new Zoomer Philosophy series. Your support will not only make content like this possible, will also help to establish a new publishing venture through Diet Soap Media. Right now, supporting me on Patreon will make a big difference.